same with it, you just got to sight down and see that it's parallel. Does it look parallel? No. It looks a little out, doesn't it? Yeah. So I didn't quite get that parallel. I'm going to tighten this top here a little bit. And see how it's getting more parallel? All right, so yes. You must have seen that and pointed it out. So. Look at this, though. Is there, how can we improve, improve that now? Improve that for me. Probably put a spacer in there. Oh, a spacer if you wanted to? Yeah. Uh, be, but you never had it, so it no. didn't evolve that way. Right? Nobody put spacers in there. You change the irons, you take, tap them out with the wedge, tap them in, adjust the depth of cut by tapping it up and down, adjusting the wedge. There's different sizes, very discreet. This is how we make, um, where do we use this? So what's the deal with the plow plane? But without a plow, you don't make, you don't work wood. Because the whole point of uh, joinery to have the grooved frame with the panel in it, which understands wood better than any other kind of construction you think of, because it's designed entirely because of wood. If this was some other material, it wouldn't look this way. We do this because we want to make a door, a lid, a panel that fills a specific opening. But wood expands and contracts with humidity. And so what we do is, of course, define the dimension of the door with long grain, because wood does not get longer and shorter. It doesn't get longer and shorter this way. It just gets fatter and skinnier, just like us. So we put a groove around the inside. We put a panel in there, deepen the panel so the panel can shrink and swell without causing any harm. So that groove is key to essentially the essence of woodworking. So you've got to have a plow plane. So here we are. We've gone to 45, 1880. We just brought one of these homes. And look at this. Isn't this great? Look at all the stuff I'm going to make for you now. I've got one of these things. Gosh, Mom. And that's well. So you can see the two adjustable uh, skates there and the fence. I'll just turn this piece over and we'll be grooving on a Sunday afternoon. I, I've got to move it in now. My fence is set too far out. So I'll undo the two thumb screws here on the fence, pull it over, get it right where I want it, tighten down that thumb screw, tighten down that thumb screw. So there's a thumb screw there on the rod and the plow right on the So it's great. And I've got all these lightweight cutters. What could go wrong? So we had that instruction on hold, how to hold the plane. So why is there a knob up here? They don't say grab the anyway, You hold it down here. Try and get as low as you can on it. What happens though? People start doing this. And the effect is, you start to tear up the side of the groove here on the near side. You see? Uh, what's happening uh, to this wall right there. You see the strings on there? Right. So we tilt it over a little bit, and by tilting over, I'm starting to tear up that wall, and I put a lot of pressure on the fence. So I continue on down, I come over and tell somebody, oh, don't tilt it over. You're gonna regret that, don't tilt it over. And so they straighten it back up. But it's too late. Why? Mm -hmm. Too late. What has Why happened? You're, no. you're off center. And you're off center. Look what happened. Look what happened. So I push down here. Look what's happening to the fence. I'm exaggerating a little bit. But is that fence set now? No. No! All right. So you go to make, look on that window sash. We've got four pieces of wood after they've been tended, after they've been mortised, and they've got to line up. So here we go, we've rocked it out maybe just a little bit there. We go to the next cut, I'm going to turn this around, <laughs> you know, we go to the next cut, and now it's 
offset uh, to the side quite a little harder to see, but you understand the principle there. All right, that is a problem that never goes away. If you don't rock, now I've seen you watch Chris uh, Schwartz working. He uses iron planes, and he has, to, he has I gave him a special pair of pliers to grab them and tighten them, which he you know to replace a pair that he was using. You have to tighten these with pliers. How long is that? Do you think the screws are going to last? And you have to do that. The only thing to do is to not rock the plane over, but it's still very frustrating. The only there is one way to get these to stay tight on there and not move, and that is spot welding. <laughs> <laughs> it will not do. Yes, it is. Yeah, I, I've tried to do this with the Exacto knife and store bought glitches of veneer that's yeah. real thin, mm -hmm. and I cannot get the points. They always break off because of the grain, short yeah. grain. Yeah. Is, I'm just using the wrong material. Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, it could be the grain. It could be that you look for something that has a little tighter grain to it, as opposed to you know a wide grain. Yeah, like the early maple, like the points are. Yeah, they, they, they do break off. Yeah, they, they do break off. And, and um, what I'll tell you is, if you come up and look at this real close, you're going to see some of those points gone too. And that's not only from the grain, that's also from the charring that we've done, the, the sand shading, because it weakens that wood as well. So you're going to lose some of those. And that's why when you do it, instead of you need 16 pieces to make your fan, make 17 or 20 or 22, because when that one breaks off, you, you toss it. And uh, the thicker wood's going to help you out. It's going to hold together a little bit more. You think about it, if you're working with uh, store bought veneers on a 40th of an inch. Two problems I have with that. One is it's so thin that the char is going to burn it really quick. The other part is that you have absolutely almost zero chance of sanding that and cleaning it up. And so this is another reason why I think there's a business for woodworkers if you wanted to cut just 16 inch veneers and sell it. Because it's. Uh, it's an area that I, I know four or five of the people that I talk to that do a lot of veneer work will not uh, do anything with uh, anything other than 60 inch because it's just, it, you can go through all this waste and all this time and then just come away with a piece of waste from there because you're basically saying yeah. through it, throwing it away. Yeah, I come to that same How did you cut those though? Did you cut them with the saw with the miter or what did you do? The, uh, the fan pieces? Yeah, the fan pieces. They're all done with, a, with a, uh, an X Acto knife or a one of these knives, just right here. I use something like this on a straight edge, usually my six inch rule. I just lay it down and, and cut it, and when this gets dull, I break off the next one. Okay. Nothing, nothing again, nothing special. These are all uh, things you can get from hardware stores and stuff. Very simple. All the black pieces were all cut out with, uh, with gouges, with carving gouges, just chopping them out and getting them lined up, put in place. People always ask me how long does it take to do a project. These clocks, when I was full time in my shop working, are about a 60 to 80 hour process. These two clocks took me a year and three months to build because I'm working on a 40 hour work week or 50 hour work week. I come home, I get in the shop on Saturday. You come into the shop on Saturday and you go, okay, now where was I? And you get it figured out, you do the work, you stop, okay, I gotta stop now and clean up. And it's a week before you get back there. And talk about lengthening the time. It was an idle. For me, for 20 years, I was just eating out stuff every day in the shop. And uh, this, this really, this project was, I got sick of it before I was done. I'm glad to have them finish this like, Get them out of here. I don't want them anymore. Yeah. When you, when you cross cutting, when you cross cut, it's, it's a cherry I just trim both ends of it. It's very ugly both ends, so we're going to clean it up. I'm going to cut off this knot a little bit, so we make a small table top out of it. So what you do is, you crank this blade up beyond, not more than a half inch. If it's a thick enough wood, you want to make sure you feel very secure and safe. You hold on to it, you hold on to it, and you push it through. Right there, I will take my out table. You see that?
you got something wrong, you need support on the outside. It's very important to understand you have a horse which is same height as the tables of plus whatever thickness of your cross that is. If I cut it something eight, ten foot, I can keep pushing it. You put it there. Get the sort of style of the Put it there and you cut it. It's a slick, slick pre-finished piece of plywood. You position it. So that you don't need your cutting. And you don't need your cutting, it doesn't fall. If you wish, you can clamp this piece of wood. Keep your hands away from that plate and push it through. It's very important to understand yourself and feel confident. You don't wanna, you don't wanna make a mistake and you don't wanna find out if this saw stuff really works. <laughs> I am the same careful with this saw as I am with the other saws. I mean, it's very obvious, very obvious. You can cut this without any danger. Not gonna bother your hands. 